welcome everyone and thank you for joining our webinar today, Election Results and Impact for the Clean Energy Economy. And before we get started, I wanted to just go over some brief housekeeping notes. So we'd ask that everyone to please keep your lines muted to avoid background noise. You can submit questions at any time using the chat function and we will go over questions at the end of the webinar. Um, we are recording this webinar and we will distribute the recording to attendees and registrants later this week. This is the sixth installment of the Powering Forward webinar series, which is produced collaboratively between the Business Council for Sustainable Energy and Clean Energy Business Network. And I'm Lynn Abramson, President of the Clean Energy Business Network. And our series examines the unique impact facing the clean energy industry in the wake of the COVID-19 pandemic along with the unique role that our industries can play in the economic recovery. Each episode is produced collaboratively with partners, and we are thrilled this episode to be working with Citizens for Responsible Energy Solutions Forum, and we'll be hearing from Charles Hernick, who is representing Crest Forum today. Uh, Crest Forum is a right of center clean energy organization. We also wanted to thank our series sponsors, which include Crestform, as well as Natixis Investment Managers, who made it possible for us to produce this series. So I'm going to turn it over briefly to Ruth McCormick, who is Director of Federal and State Policy for the Business Council for Sustainable Energy, to introduce our, their organization. So Ruth, over to you. Thank you, Lynn. Um, I'm hoping that everyone can hear me okay. Yes. My name is Ruth McCormick, and I am the Director of Federal and State Programs for the Business Council for Sustainable Energy, or BCSE. BCSE is a trade association that was first organized in 1992, and it consists of both trade associations and businesses from across the clean energy space. We include uh, technologies, products and services, um, providers from the energy efficiency, natural gas, and renewable energy sectors. We advocate for policies to expand the use of these commercially available clean energy technologies. We do that at a federal, state, and international level. Um, we have recently released a policy document prior to the election that outlines what our policy objectives are, both for the upcoming lane duck session, but looking forward into the 117th Congress that focuses on the priority areas that we've worked on recently around issues um, entailing clean energy tax policy, energy policy, um, reliance and reliability and um, also in areas around reducing greenhouse gas emissions. And so we look forward very much to hearing from our speakers today about their take and their outlook for the post-election so that we can work together with our partners, including the Clean Energy Business Network, to advance these policies. So thank you very much and back to you, Lynn. Great, thank you, Ruth. And I'll just make note of uh, these are the Business Council for Sustainable Energy's current members. And the Clean Energy Business Network serves as a subsidiary of the BCSE. We are the small business voice for the clean energy economy, working to represent small companies in this space through policy support, market and technology education, and business development assistance. And our network spans more than 4,500 small businesses nationwide across all 50 states. So today I'm really thrilled to be joined by uh, these four thought leaders representing both sides of the aisle to focus on the outcomes of the November 3rd national election and its implications for the clean energy economy. <laughs> so our speakers today are clean energy and policy experts with viewpoints from across the political spectrum. And we're going to hear from them, them about the prospects for energy legislation and policies in the lean duck period, which is the period between now and the time when the next administration and Congress take office, uh, looking ahead into the 117th Congress and the next presidential administration. So we're joined today by John Hart, who is co-founder and vice president for C3 Solutions, Charles Hernick, who is Vice President of Policy and Advocacy for Citizens for Responsible Energy Solutions Forum, or CREST Forum, 
Nidhi Takar, who is co-chair of Clean Energy for Biden and director of strategy for Portland General Electric, and Karen Wayland, who is uh, principal at KW Energy Strategies. And before we turn to their panel, I will give you a little bit more insight into their bios um, and, and how that their backgrounds shape their viewpoints on clean energy. But before we go to our panel discussion, I want to start with just a brief overview of the current status of the election results, which I'm sure everyone has been tracking, but seems to evolve minute by minute and day by day. So the current latest, the latest uh, update is that the uh, presidential race has been called by major media outlets for Joe Biden and his Vice President Kamala Harris, with 290 electoral votes reporting. Both Georgia and North Carolina remain too close to call, um, and Georgia is currently undergoing a recount. However, the outcomes of those states should not impact the grand total of 270 votes. Um, as we know, President Trump is currently litigating the election results in a handful of states, um, so that will definitely slow down and kind of impact the transition period. As far as the House of Representatives, Democrats retained control of the House, um, but I think a number of pundits were quite surprised by how many seats Republicans gained, uh, given the, that this election was favoring the Democratic presidential candidates. So far, Republicans have picked up six states, six seats rather, and there are 15 elections that are still too close to call. Um, but overall, we shouldn't see a shift in the overall leadership or committee leadership. Apologies, I just lost something there. The, um, the Senate uh, is, Senate leadership is hanging on by a razor thin wire. The Democrats held on to their seats in all states except for Alabama and flipped two seats in Arizona and Colorado. And so when you factor in the two independent senators who caucus with the Democrats, that gives them 48 seats. Republicans currently hold 50. And the two Georgia Senate seats, so the regular election as well as a special election uh, to uh, replace a gubernatorial appointee, are both too close to call. So the state's Election laws uh, require that candidates must reach 50% plus one vote, and both of those elections fell short of that threshold. So we're currently in a runoff period, and those races will be decided in January. So the scenarios are that if Democrats pick up both of those seats, they will have the majority, even though there will be a 50-50 split because Vice President Kamala Harris would be the tie-breaking vote. However, if uh, Republicans retain even one of those seats, they will retain the majority. Either way, we're going to see a very closely divided Senate, and um, so, you know, definitely it's going to be a, a very thin margin. And this map kind of gives you an overview of the current status of those, those races. So with that, I want to give you a little bit more background on each of our panelists. I'm going to give a very truncated bio for each of them because they have uh, brought a wealth of experience to this conversation, but I think understanding a little bit more about each of their perspectives will help you understand the commentary that they're going to provide today. So I mentioned uh, John Hart represents Seed Free Solutions, and he's an influential thought leader in the conservative movement. He previously served in positions with Senator Tom Coburn and U.S. Representative Steve Larjon and Jim DeMitt. He has advised numerous corporations, nonprofits, and political campaigns. And in 2013, Time Magazine named him as one of the world's most influential people. Um, Charles Hernick leads policy and strategy development for Citizens for Responsible Energy Solutions Forum, a right of center nonprofit working to advance clean energy. He previously held positions at the EPA and U.S. Agency for International Development and was the Republican candidate. Uh, for Virginia's 8th Congressional District in the November 2016 election. And then on the other side of the aisle, we have Nidhi Takar, who is co-chair of Clean Energy for Biden and director of strategy for Portland General Electric, which is Oregon's largest utility. She previously served as a senior advisor in the DOE Loan Programs Office under the Obama administration and has held positions in the California Public Utilities Commission, Center for American Progress, and law firms. And then last but certainly not least, we have Karen Wayland of KW Energy Strategies. 
which provides strategic consulting on policy development, coalition building, and communications for corporations, nonprofits, and local officials. She previously worked for many years under Speaker Nancy Pelosi and held senior political positions in the U.S. Department of Energy under the Obama administration. She's also served in positions at Clean Energy Projects in Nevada, as well as NRDC. During her tenure with Speaker Pelosi, she was named by Roll Call Magazine as one of Capitol Hill's top 10 energy staffers. So um, these are essentially individuals who have all been in the room where it happens and can share their insights on what we can expect in the months and years ahead. So we welcome all of our panelists, and I'm going to invite you all to unmute yourselves and make sure your cameras are on for this conversation. And thank you. So, thank you, Lynn. Yeah, so thank you for joining us. Um, I guess maybe starting from uh, at top left down to uh, right and then down from John to Needy to Charles and then Karen, maybe we could just go around the horn and have each of you introduce yourselves and tell us a little bit more about your organization and give us just your first take high level reactions to the outcome of the elections and what it means for clean energy. Very well. Lynn, thank you so much. This is John Hart speaking. I uh, uh, really appreciate you and the Clean Energy Business Network for just in this discussion. And I, I do have to say at the outset, you, you unintentionally inflated my resume. I was not named one of one of the hundred most influential people. And my boss was Tom Coburn at the time. I and Barack Obama wrote the essay. <laughs> it's okay. Maybe next year. Maybe someday. If we, if we, if we keep, if you know, Charles and I and the others keep working on this issue. You know, maybe maybe we'll arrive at that destination. But anyway, thank you for that kind introduction, nonetheless. Uh, just very very quickly, so C3 Solutions, we stand for the Conservative Coalition for Climate Solutions. And our, our very quick origin story is Drew Bond, who I know many of you know, he's my, my co-founder. Drew was Ed Fulmer's chief of staff, and through a series of, of uh, entrepreneur, entrepreneurial activities, he started the solar company called Powerfield Energy. A few, couple years ago, I bought a farm. I live about an hour outside of DC. So Drew and I have been friends for over 20 years. So Drew came out and we discussed how do we put solar on my sustainable farm? And we had this chuckle about, you know, two right wingers having this moment on, on clean energy. And, and it was an epiphany because we realized we're not outliers. There are many, many people on the right who think like we do, who believe very passionately in free markets, the free enterprise system, uh, we're, we're constitutional conservatives, but we also care a lot about conservation. I think uh, we need to play offense in this space and, and not defense. So that's that's the, the essence of what uh, C3 Solutions is about. And my, my quick take on the election, I have a piece up. Uh, we have a news magazine called uh, C3 News, uh, and a piece up right now on real clear policy. And my conclusion is the 2020 election was a rejection of excess. It was a rejection of what I would describe as the progressive left's ideological access and a rejection of President Trump's individual access. And there's, there's a whole lot to unpack there, and I, I don't want to spend too much time at the outset, but uh, Liz, as, you, as you described in your opening, uh, the, the Democrats came much closer to losing the House than riding the blue wave. And I think that's a, that's a very significant conclusion that I think is going to take a lot of thought um, and discussion over the over this you know this forum but over the, the days weeks ahead and of course we could spend a lot of time on President Trump's uh, self inflicted wounds but I don't know that that's that's the most productive <laughs> as Charles is, uh, would probably agree uh, so that's my high level take and we can get into all that in more detail as we as we talk. Very interesting and um, I like that perspective of the. Rejection of excess on both sides. So, uh, Needy, over to you. Do we have you back on? I know you were having some computer difficulties for a minute. Yes, I was having some technical difficulties. Can you hear me okay now? We hear you just great. Yeah. Fantastic. It's it's uh, fantastic to be with you all today uh, for this, uh, what I suspect is going to be a very interesting conversation. I'm really looking forward to it. Um, so, Nitty Tacker, I'm with Portland General Electric. Um, uh, I am also, that's my day job as director of strategy. Um, I'm also a coach for clean energy for Biden. As, as Lynn mentioned, Karen Wayland on this call is also a fellow co-chair with clean energy for Biden. Um, so, you know, I would say at a very high level, um, you know, Portland General Electric is the largest utility um, in Oregon. We have annual revenues of roughly about 200 
12 million. Um, you know, I joined the utility back in January. Um, interestingly enough, because I have, I have a true commitment to decarbonization as a personal value set. Um, and I, uh, was able to find a utility that shared a similar, similar value set. Um, Portland General Electric is very much committed to rapid decarbonization, electrification, uh, while still recognizing that as a utility, we're an essential service provider and we have to provide clean, reliable, and affordable uh, electric service, which is becoming increasingly uh, critical as we see a lot of the climate impacts manifesting themselves, uh, particularly in the West over the last year through wildfires and, and, and other sort of um, uh, grave changes that we're seeing um, in, in climate. Um, you know, I would say from uh, the perspective of a, an electric utility committed to rapid decarbonization, you know, we are um, we're excited to, to see the changes on the horizon potentially um, in the Senate. You know, we have to see what happens on that front. I think new leadership in the White House hopefully means that this is going to provide a better runway for uh, opportunity to think from a business perspective about how we can um, further support innovation, uh, rapid decarbonization through renewables and other technologies, um, well-designed clean energy tax credits. That has been a huge uh, driver for the industry. Um, and transportation electrification and infrastructure, of course, two additional angles to climate that are very much front and center, um, have been through legislation in Congress of, of late. And um, I think the reality is, is as we look at reducing economy-wide uh, GHG emissions, you really can't um, tackle that problem without uh, addressing trans the transportation sector, which is, which is a very uh, critical component to that. So, you know, I think as an electric utility, again, we really see the prospect of, um, you know, this, the change in the future and the election that we've had as an opportunity to further rapid decarbonization and electrification. Um, you know, I think from the standpoint of, of uh, being co-chair, of being a co-chair for clean energy for Biden, um, you know, we, we were, um, I think, really impressed with um, how climate was front and center in this campaign cycle. I think that applies not only to, um, you know, the election of um, uh, President-elect Biden, but it also applies to what we saw um, in terms of this being a, a major policy driver in many races across the country. And I think that it's just, frankly, it's a reminder, and I think we see it even on this call, that um, you know, addressing GHG emissions and climate is is a bipartisan issue. It's an issue that we're all concerned about, and we all see um, opportunity in and a chance to also think about how we can better drive innovation through that process. Well, thank you so much, Nidhi, and I really appreciate what you said about um, how climate was front and center, and we're going to come back to that towards the end of this conversation. Uh, I want to go over to you, Charles. I saw you making some colorful facial expressions while John was speaking. So what, what's your two cents well, on the election? It's just because I think John is a very influential person, and, and I agree with a lot of what he said, of, of course. But first, Lynn, I want to thank you, um, CEBN and, and BCSC, for your partnership over the years, for the excellent technical programming that you all uh, put together, uh, and to put together this conversation, which is both necessary and, and really timely, because I think there are a lot of question marks. There are probably more unanswered questions um, that, that we will be able to navigate through over the course of the next uh, few months. But I think the consensus is that we want to hit the ground running in, in 2021. And um, just to, to step back, um, Citizens for Responsible Energy Solutions Forum, um, we're a 501c3 that's focused on uh, raising the profile of, of clean energy solutions uh, with conservatives and Republicans um, and helping to find those pathways with a, a basic thesis that is durable, long-term clean energy and climate solutions are bipartisan by definition. And we are sincerely aiming to do our part right of center, both to identify new ideas uh, to push hard um, and, and to provide the necessary education uh, to get traction on those ideas, uh, to do polling, to understand better where conservatives are. And, and Nadie's exactly right. Uh, climate change and clean energy were 
um, on the mind of, of many voters. They weren't top of mind uh, for conservatives, but one of our recent polls showed that 72% of Republicans want to see federal action on climate change. Now, the, the Republican approach is, is certainly going to be different than, than something that some of the ideas on, on the left, and I'm sure that we'll have uh, time for that. But we want to, to create a pathway to, to be able to double down on what's working uh, from a federal uh, standpoint, double down on what's working from a state standpoint. Uh, as conservatives, that's something that we do respect uh, and that we want to look forward to. Uh, and I think that the election result was just that, that Americans um, uh, it are, are certainly interested in a, a balanced and, and from the middle approach, at least in terms of how they um, split their tickets or, or vote, uh, voted for president and then voted for House, um, who they voted for, who they didn't fill out the ballot for. Um, so it's, it's been impressive to me, uh, for sure, and I think that there's a, a lot of opportunity and I look forward to this conversation. Excellent. Well, we definitely welcome that partnership and um, I find it very encouraging to see how this has become an, an area with growing bipartisan interest. So appreciate that. Thank you, Charles. And then Karen, I wanted to turn it over to you. Um, my brother's name is Charles, and so we always hear Charles and Karen, Charles and Karen. So I agree with everything you said, Charles. I'm a big Crest fan, and thank you, Lynn and CEBN, for uh, for hosting this. Um, going last, I get to say yes to Nitty, yes to John, yes to Charles, um, all brilliant observations. Um, I uh, I do a lot of work with um, in, in my consulting business with utilities and tech businesses, on grid modernization and cybersecurity, you know, big picture energy policy and the investments that we need to reach, uh, you know, on the grid to accommodate all of these very ambitious goals of the state and potentially at the federal level for um, for addressing climate change. I've also, um, over the last couple of years, worked with the National Association of State Energy Officials and the uh, Secretary Moniz's Energy Futures Initiative, and as well as Lynn and and um, uh, on the uh, Energy Jobs Report at DOE initially put out uh, two versions of and then um, declined to do it under the Trump administration. And it's, it, you know, and, and it's a compelling story about jobs in the clean energy space, but it's also equally compelling that um, as a result of the economic uh, downturn and COVID that clean energy space has lost a significant number of jobs, as has the rest of the economy. And particularly, I'm calling in from Nevada and we have some serious um, unemployment issues here as a result of, of what the economy and the downturn is doing to our hospitality industry. So I think going forward into 2021, they're going to be, you know, the Biden administration is going to have to um, really address this jobs issue and Congress is going to have to address the jobs issue. There's just no question that um, the states are in dire, dire financial straits and they don't have the ability to borrow um, to do deficit spending, which is what will help us get out of this economic downturn. And that means that in some way, the federal government is going to have to inject more uh, um, funding, money into the economy. So I think, you know, under a Biden administration, we're going to see, um, you know, this move to increase investments in the clean energy space, both to create jobs and to uh, scale up deployment to address um, climate emissions, carbon emissions. But I think we're also going to see that the Biden administration will really be looking for common ground. That's what Joe Biden has done over his career working in the Senate, and, and I think he's well-liked, even by some of the very conservative um, senators in um, that he's going to have to work with in order to, to get to 51 votes on anything. So common ground is one thing. I think the other thing is that in a Biden administration, there will be uh, a real focus on governance and on building back the role of the agencies. You know, we, we've seen under this current administration, um, you know, massive um, flight of really good talent um, and the, the kind of visionary, uh, young, medium career and senior career people that that can help efficiently run agencies um, and look for look to see how government can respond to trends. Um, so I, I I believe that we'll see this turn to an emphasis on good governance and um, rebuilding the agencies. I also think that the agencies um, have a real opportunity to help the states with their goals. That you know they're they're the states are going to continue push the envelope. Um, when I was at DOE, I established a state local tribal policy team for Secretary Moniz because he recognized that so much of the work on energy policy is happening at the state level and he wanted to be able to marshal all the resources that DOE has to help the states with their goals. I I'm hoping that we see a return to that kind of 
model of, of really marshalling federal resources to help states do what they would like to do. It's kind of the ultimate um, embodiment of federalism. And, you know, under the Trump administration, uh, they continually tried to kill the state energy program, uh, which is a program that actually in many states funds the basic operations of the governors uh, across all Republican or Democratic governors, that that state energy program funds the operation of the state energy programs. So I, I think you're going to see a 180 degree change there in terms of support for the state energy programs and for um, all of the different technical assistance programs and grants and other resources that can help states. Yeah, I appreciate that. And I, I think some of the specific programs you touched on are really that's valuable information. And I certainly share your hope that we will see a bit of consensus and bipartisanship. So um, next question I wanted to, before we turn further into the outlook for 2021, let's talk about the next few months and the lame duck Congress ahead of us before the next, before the 117th Congress is sworn in. And um, this is a question open to all of you, but maybe let's start with Charles and Karen, as I think you're, you know, really have an eye on this. Um, what are some of the policy opportunities, if any, for clean energy before the next Congress is sworn in? And um, if there are no likely path forward for clean energy, what kinds of missed opportunities could be left on the table? Well, I wonder if Karen and I can say American Energy Innovation Act at the same time. I was just going to say that. <laughs> so, really, that's um, the, the primary thing, and, and the lowest hanging fruit between Republicans and Democrats in any talking point is innovation. And right now, um, the Senate, thanks to the multi and bipartisanship um, uh, that Senator Murkowski um, has been able to put together a bill that is um, it is a fantastic down payment on climate change. Um, it's squarely focused on innovation. It provides a tremendous update to where we need to be uh, for, for updating things from nuclear policy to, to carbon capture and, and many others. Um, there is a narrow window, um, but it is one where there are active negotiations on Capitol Hill right now. Um, and uh, maybe I'll, I'll pass it over to you to provide some, some more details, but that's a, a live wire and certainly something that would be a, a great way to end what has otherwise been a funky 2020. Yeah, and I was just on a phone call with Senator Manchin, the ranking member of the Energy and Natural Resources Committee, and he was, um, I would say, cautiously optimistic. It is, you know, there are 72 senators that support the bill, and there's been no action on energy really to speak of in many years and so this is an opportunity i think that it's also you know i've been thinking a lot about what a uh, recovery act style bill would look like in the you know in 2021 or even a scaled back set of investments in some sort of infrastructure week and i'm a firm believer that if you want to get money into the economy quickly you've got to use it through existing you've got to move it through existing programs and some of those programs for example the um title 13 smart grid invest you know smart grid um programs that were created in 2007 and then money was funneled through those programs in 2009 recovery act they're outdated and they need to be you know their their authorization needs to be updated and so we're we're seeing both new programs in the american um innovation act but also increases in authorization meaning that that um you know potentially more money could flow into these programs and slight tweaks in the purpose and operating philosophy of those programs which i think brings brings these programs into the 21st century and, and meeting the challenges that we have today, not 10 years ago. So um, I, I think some um, House members are interested in seeing that bill pass because it kind of clears the deck and allows them to turn to potentially a clean energy standard um, and other pieces of energy policy in the 20, you know, in 2021. And I will say, if I could, just one more thing that um, it, it could potentially be left on the table. If Congress doesn't do a large rescue bill, another kind of COVID-19 response bill that includes funding for LIHEAP, um, it's going to be very difficult over the coming years for utilities. You know, there's going to be a lot of suffering. People are going to be holding billions of dollars collectively in debt in unpaid electricity bills. Um, but the utilities and the public utility commissions that approve their plans to um, move towards clean energy and make clean energy investments are really going to be hamstrung if there are what is projected to be 
tens of billions of dollars in lost revenue from low load and light heat, or from mm -hmm. unpaid bills. And so if Congress doesn't address the massive shortfalls in light heat funding um, for utility bills uh, in, you know, between now and the end of the year, we're going to be in a, a very big world of hurt starting off in 2021. Yeah, and I, I would certainly add, I think if we don't advance any more um, paycheck protection program reauthorization, I, we've already seen that the clean energy industry is heavily utilizing that and there's going to be a lot of layoffs. I would, uh, John or Nidhi was just curious if you have anything you would add as far as Wayne Duck and, and do you think there's any prospects for advancing the American Energy Innovation Act on a spending bill? Um, so I'll just jump in here real quick and say, um, you know, I agree uh, with what Karen flagged in particular on LIHEAP. Of course, agree with a lot of what Charles and Karen raised uh, previously. Um, you know, from the standpoint of uh, an electricity service provider, um, you know, the LIHEAP dollars that were issued in the in the first COVID package were incredibly helpful to customers here in Oregon. I know that's the case nationally. Um, you know, all essential service providers, not just electric utilities, gas utilities, water utilities, are all suffering the same sort of situation with um, concerns over customers being able to pay their bills and what that means for um, all of these essential service providers. Uh, being able to um, continue to provide uh, the customer products and innovation um, that's needed in the future to have a decarbonize. So I think that remains very much front and center. Um, you know, I would just say um, I do think we have some missed opportunities uh, if we can't get um, another COVID relief package through. Uh, you know, clearly on the um, on the public. Uh, paycheck protection standpoint, but very much on the energy energy side too. I mean, I think um, there's missed opportunities for infrastructure development there. There's um, missed opportunities for clean energy tax credits being extended. Um, so, you know, I would just add that as as an additional two cents. Yeah, and I would I would echo a few of those points, but unfortunately, having worked in the Senate for ten years. I, I learned the hard way to have very low expectations of movement and then to have those expectations exceeded. And I, I'm concerned that in the short term, whenever there's an unstable power dynamic in the Senate, that makes it very difficult for any major packages to move, which I think we all we all know and have observed. And, and uh, you know, I certainly lived through when I was a, a Senate aide. But I do think there are, are major areas of common ground and overlap uh, that some of the panels have touched on. It, uh, investing in, in infrastructure is certainly one. Uh, investing in basic R and D, uh, and I think conservatives could get on board with with increased investments uh, if we offset it. If we, the phrase I like to use with my conservative friends is recycling government waste. You know, take spending that's not very useful and repurpose it towards uh, good ends. So. And so I think, I think the reality is we face two major stress tests, I think, for our democracy uh, on a policy uh, level. One is the post-COVID recovery, uh, the, 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 the debt crisis that could come out of that, the economic crisis, however you want to define how that could look. There's, we're over-leveraged in very dangerous ways. We're running out of tools in the, in the toolbox to get out of it. And so I think what Congress has to do is do fundamental rethinking top to bottom of what government's doing. And this area and lots of others. Uh, I, I'm optimistic because uh, I think to, to what Karen and others have said, Joe Biden genuinely does believe in bipartisanship. Uh, Bruce Reed, one of his senior aides, I don't know what role Bruce will have, but we work closely together on the Simpson Bulls Commission after the 2007-2008 fiscal crisis. So I think there's there's uh, certainly an appetite to think big, to, to go big and bipartisan, uh, but it's going to take a lot of work and careful planning to get there. Well, that is a great segue into my next question, uh, and maybe we'll start with Nidhi and Karen and then have a response from the other side of the aisle from John and Charles. Um, but I would like to know what is your assessment of the Biden administration's plans for climate change and clean energy? Are there things you particularly like? Are there things that you wish were not included or that were um, you know, currently left off the table. What are, what are your assessments? Sure. I'll jump in here, and I'm sure Karen will have plenty to add. Um, you know, I think the Biden climate
climate clean energy plan represents a very aggressive shift um, in focus to clean energy. And we're talking about efforts for carbon neutrality by the middle of the century. Um, you know, there is very much a clear need for massive federal investment through that process, as indicated by the dollars we saw in that plan. Um, you know, I think there's a lot of question as to where the money comes from and whether Congress is appropriating those dollars. I think the reality of how, um, you know, how we see public funds leveraged, and I experienced this quite a bit in the loan programs office at DOE, is there's a true opportunity here for um, the private sector and foundations to come together to support a lot of these clean energy uh, policies and programs that are going to be moved forward. Um, there's a very clear need to be able to leverage public dollars with private capital. And frankly, there's a lot of capital out there that is very hungry and looking for investment in sort of what the next era of clean energy technologies are going to look like. So, you know, I do think, again, on the massive federal investment front, there's, there's tremendous opportunity for multiple uh, sectors to be working together and it not it to really not just be a lift for government um, to do. And then I would add on, you know, I think with everything going on nationally right now, we've seen the need for equitable solutions uh, to really uh, take front and center stage. You know, I think the reality is, is we're having um we're not just having a, a dialogue about our planet and climate right now. We're having a dialogue about some very difficult issues in this country, um, you know, issues that have existed for decades and are now fully, um, you know, really front and center uh, issues dealing with environmental justice um, and a question of, you know, what the clean energy industry looks like, who are the faces in the clean energy industry, who has access to these resources, where these resources cited, um, you know, I think there again, there's it's a it's a massive challenge, but there's a tremendous amount of opportunity, and we've seen that front and center in the in the in Biden's climate plan. Um, you know, equity and who really will have access to these resources in the future um, is very much top of mind. Um, and you know, I would also just like to come back to one issue that Karen raised early on, which is the federal workforce, you know, uh, Biden has a commitment to um, ensuring that the federal workforce looks like the face of this country. And that is absolutely critical. Um, it's absolutely critical that we're going to be able to rebuild that workforce to, to have the um, smart minds needed to get the work done. I mean, the reality is, is the federal workforce has been gutted in the last four years. And, you know, I, I read the other day that EPA, for example, um, lost more than 700 scientists under the Trump administration. It's really only filled about half of those roles. That's just one agency. And that's just, you know, a specific analysis that was done on scientists. But, you know, when you think about all the other agencies that have a role in addressing climate change, um, interior, Department of Energy, Commerce, um, you know, the list goes on. Uh, that's going to be... Um, a real critical need for this administration moving forward. Karen, I think we still have you on mute. Let's get you. All right, I have a little yippy dog in the background and he keeps hearing the neighbor's kids, so I keep muting myself because <laughs> you don't need to hear him as well. Um, so what I what I like about the um, Biden plan, and full disclosure, I was with Speaker Pelosi when we did the Waxman Markey Economy Wide Cap and Trade Bill. Um, I was on the House floor when uh, when it passed, and I said to my chief of staff, "If this doesn't um, if this doesn't fly in the Senate quickly, we're not. We're, it's going to be a decade or more before we're able to do anything like this again." And he's like, "A decade? Try 15 years." Well. You know, here we are 11, 12 years later, uh, and there's no possible chance of uh, in the in the political realm that a an economy wide approach to reducing carbon um, that is that is like a market based economy wide framework will work. However, if you do a sector by sector approach, you can find a lot more carrots than sticks in order to try to get those um, those reductions out of each sector. The question is, where does the money for the carrots come from? I think there are going to be a few places where there absolutely are going to need to be some um, some 
increased uh, regulation, and that uh, in particular is in the trans transportation sector around fuel efficiency standards. And it is possible to to pull the industry together and find a consensus around fuel efficiency standards. Um, we had that um, in the Obama administration, and I think it's going to be critical that that um, that he and he will pull together the the uh, vehicle industry and other stakeholders to work on fuel efficiency standards for vehicles. Which brings me to another thing that I really like about the plan, which is this this um, idea of more coordination, not just a one czar, but really more coordination, like a body at the White House to do this coordination. Because for example, even if we do nothing in terms of like new, you know, a clean energy standard, there are gonna be investments made in different um, departments. For example, the Republican surface transportation bill that passed out of the Energy and Public Works Committee has a billion dollars to the DOT program, uh, the, the Alternative Fuels Corridor Program for um, alternative fuel charging infrastructure. Now, if a billion dollars goes there for grants to state and local governments for charging infrastructure, that's a lot of charging. Some of it will go to biofuel, some of it will go to hydrogen. But that's a lot of money to the states for um, charging infrastructure. Over at DOE, they have the expertise to work with the states and with the utilities to try to figure out what the parallel investments need to be made in order to accommodate all that vehicle charging infrastructure. But if there's no coordination across the agencies for all of these individual decisions that agencies will make, then we'll get really um, ineffective solutions and deployment of technology. So I, I do like the idea of having not just one person, but a coordinating council in the White House. And then on the equity issue, um, I agree with everything that he said. I'll just note that it, it isn't enough to say that um, addressing climate change will reduce pollution, will reduce uh, the impacts on those who are uh, the most vulnerable. We also have to look to make sure that the benefits beyond you know, the amorphous reduction in CO2 lands in those communities. So when grants are being made to businesses, when decisions are made about where EV infrastructure is placed, that the equity lens has to be placed on that to make sure that um, we actually are, you know, uh, sharing the benefits across all of us. They're all great points. And um, so now I want to turn it over to the other side of the aisle and get your reactions because I think those reactions will help us understand uh, how a very closely divided Congress will process these policy proposals. Yeah, Lynn, I'll, I'll jump in here and, and uh, John, feel free to, to jump in as appropriate. But I'll, I'll start with a couple of, of good things. Um, when, when upon taking office, uh, President Biden will, will bring the United States back into the Paris Accord, and that's a good thing. Uh, Citizens for Responsible Energy Solutions, we were among the many conservative organizations and conservative voices that said that pulling out was uh, a bad idea. We were firm believers that we should stay in and, and try to continue negotiating and negotiate something better for U.S. interests. Um, and there's no substitute for U.S. leadership at the international level, period. So coming back into the Paris Accord is a good thing, and I think you'll see a lot of Republicans uh, say that uh, when, it, when it does happen. Um, the focus on, on methane uh, that, that President Biden has, has promised, and, and I'm not under the hood, I just go by what I read on the website, uh, but the focus on, on regulating methane is, is certainly going to be uh, important for combating climate. It's also going to be welcomed by industry. The, the Trump administration's rollback of some of the methane uh, rules were out of step with where industry wanted and, and actually saw a beneficial um, uh, orientation. Uh, and so that, that focus on methane will be um, important, not just for climate, but for um, establishing consistency in business planning. The goal for net zero by 2050 is, is good. Um, I think that we need to be able to talk about time-bound um, approaches to, to be able to achieve uh, emissions reductions, but I think that some of the mandates that have been proposed, obviously the details aren't, aren't there yet, but to the extent that we're rebalancing or changing um, the balance of power between the federal government and states that for the past hundred years have had um, the ability to control their own um, energy mixes, uh, you're going to see a certain tension there, uh, that, that's for sure. So, so that's going to be an, an area for, for continued focus. And to the extent that there is any ban on new oil and gas uh, leases on, on public lands, um, I do think that's problematic, not just because some of those revenues do actually fund uh, public parks and national parks, but, but because 
the world is reducing, the, the United States is reducing emissions and the United States has changed its geopolitical position over the course of the last decade because of an ability to develop and deploy oil and natural gas. And natural gas has been a key part of the mix. And if we walk away from that arena, even if it's at the margin, um, the benefit goes to Russia and our, ad, our geopolitical adversaries uh, in the Middle East. And that's uh, certainly problematic. So to manage those consequences with our energy policy is going to be a, a critical focus. Um, so maybe I'll stop there and, and uh, turn it over to John for, for some additional comment. Yeah, thanks, Charles. A few things I'd amplify is just going back to what C3 Solutions uh, mission is. We have four pillars on our, on our side in terms of what we articulate for policy. One is understanding the economic impacts of climate change, accelerating energy innovation, disaster prevention and mitigation. We haven't talked a lot about that. And ag innovation and sustainability. So just in those four buckets that have got a conservative group, let's say we're four, there's a lot of areas of collaboration uh, and opportunities that I see. Uh, the way the way I approach this is I, I really like Bill Gates' framing, where he says we're about two dozen major innovations short on really meaningfully uh, you know, turning, moving the needle, so to speak, on climate. And so the question is, is how do we get to those innovations? And that's where, uh, it, you know, just to, to wear my conservative colors very, very boldly, I think the less government, the more innovation we have, the better off we are. And so I, I applaud Charles' language on shifting the balance of power, but it's shifting it from the federal government to the states to individuals, because ultimately it's going to be individual entrepreneurs, job creators, people we haven't met, ideas we haven't even thought of, that are going to be game changers. And so, so the question is, how do we create an economic environment where we encourage those technologies to come to the forefront and then be deployed? So that means reforming NEPA. It means... Uh, keeping taxes low, keeping regulation low. Uh, I think the one, one, one of the issues that's probably a non-starter for, for you know, Republicans is going to be any kind of a carbon tax, however it's defined. That's an idea that's much more popular on the outside than it is within, within uh, uh, you know, the policy policymaker realm. Uh, but all I have to say is I think there's, there's, there's far more that unites us than divides us. And, and I applaud and agree wholeheartedly with the environmental justice goals and the articulation of that value. And to echo Charles' concern, I think if we if we move in, in the wrong way, if we move in a way that's too top down, too much of a command and control, we run the risk of significantly increasing energy prices for people who can't afford to have increases in energy price. And that that is that is an environmental justice issue that I think we can all have a very meaningful uh, dialogue about. And how do we solve that problem? Great. I really appreciate uh, all of those insights, and I think that gives us a sense of the range of what's possible. I'm going to dive deeper into those issues. Um, and I'm going to try to work in some of the questions we're getting in the chat box as I, you know, pepper them into my questions for all of you. Um, but let's start with the prospects of Congress based on the Jordan question. So, as we mentioned, we have a very, um, you know, uh, a very narrowly divided Congress, and it's going to be a very close division in the Senate either way. But uh, all those chairmanships, you know, leadership positions, uh, the votes will be impacted by those Georgia runoffs. So how, I guess, let's maybe start now with uh, John and Charles and then go to Nidhi and Karen. But um, how, how much will that division of power impact the prospects for the Biden agenda? And what do you envision as being the energy priorities if we do have a split Congress where Republicans maintain control of the Senate? What kinds of things do you think will get through in the next Congress? I would just, just quickly, I would say it's, it's going to have a, a major, it's hard to overstate how significant that that uh, that result is going to be. And I, I would predict it's likely that Republicans will retain uh, you know, candidly, I'm very concerned about how the, the recount quote unquote discussions unfolding and what uh, impact that could have in the Georgia races. I mean, there's there's a lot of heartburn on the right about uh, about misplaced priorities right now. Uh, but assuming assuming we do hold those two seats, I think it's going to be a fascinating fight among Republican senators. Uh, one factor that's hard to overstate also how significant this is is. Uh, with, without President Trump tweeting every day, 
Republican senators will be able to offer ideas without their first comment being, well, this is what the president's meant to say in his tweet. So having that, having that taken off the table, I guarantee you, is an incredible relief to, to legislators in the Senate on the right. Uh, so, so my hope is that leads to a renaissance of ideas. I think Senator Mike Lee has been great on NEPA reform. Uh, there's a lot of intellectual energy. You know, Charles and, and Chris can talk a lot about that with you know, Senator Braun and others. So I'm hopeful that leads to a lot of, uh, of solutions being advanced. Um, and there's and there's going to be a presidential race. There's going to be you know the twenty twenty four candidates uh, competing to have a leadership mantle on this issue, and I think that's a profoundly good thing. Uh, even if you're on the far quote far left, you should be very grateful that there is going to be a fight on the right about who has the best message on climate, and and we're committed at C three solutions to helping be a very constructive voice in that, Charles and. Of course, I've been in this for a long time. Um, so I, I'll, I'll pass it on to Charles. At that. There's, there's a lot more to say, but I'll, I'll hand it over to him. Yeah, thanks, John. And, and I'll, I'll try to be succinct um, because I, I think that in a divided government scenario, the biggest thing that we can and should do is examine what's going well and what's not in terms of the existing federal role. There's a lot, John mentioned NEPA. There's a lot that we need to be able to do to get offshore wind projects permitted in a timely manner uh, and uh, being able to be developed in, in under two years. If we're serious about tackling climate change, we need to be able to have uh, flexibility and, and coordination to execute those transmission projects, to bring clean energy from, from one part of the country uh, to population centers, looking at hydropower uh, licensing and, and relicensing. The current, it takes seven years uh, to, to bring a hydropower project to, to get it relicensed or to bring it online, and that's just quite frankly too slow. There are 88,000 dams in this country, and only 3% of them provide electricity. And uh, where, where Nitty is, maybe half of those dams need to be taken down to restore riparian corridors and, and help out with uh, salmon habitat and, and whatnot, but for the rest of it, we should be producing power on uh, what are many uh, federal uh, federal projects. So there's a, a clear opportunity there to power non-power dams, to develop renewables on, on federal land. Uh, there's a clear role for the federal government um, there, but also focusing on, on energy efficiency. The, the topic of environmental justice has come up a couple times already, and I think that's um, absolutely important and one where the federal government has a very clean and specific role as a property owner and, and manager. Um, I think that many of us are familiar with uh, urban housing projects and the, the truly, um, I'm going to say disastrous condition that a lot of them are in, that, that where I've lived in, in Boston or currently in Annapolis. Uh, it's, a, it's a human tragedy um, that is there. And we can, with the hook of improving energy efficiency, we can uh, make sure that the cold air stays out in the winter, that the um, cool air stays inside uh, in the summer, and that, that the heat doesn't creep in to be able to help improve public health outcomes while also um, saving uh, energy and reducing greenhouse gas emissions. So there's, there's really a lot. Looking at innovation, um, you know, we need to, to uh, do the American Energy Innovation Act, that's going to be a, a down payment and a, and a good first start, but looking how to ramp up um, other types of, of innovation spending to complement what the private sector is already doing. Um, I think that one thing is that there's no shortage of capital for new clean energy deployment. That's where there's plenty of money uh, out there, and, and if uh, you know folks are looking for, for good projects to invest in, um, there's no shortage of, of capital. The real constraint is in this pipeline of project development and being inciting uh, that we see in so many uh, places uh, across the, the country. And that's something where uh, the, the US government can help. So I'll, I'll stop there um, because I think that the divided government scenario um, means that we have to focus on existing federal rules and, uh, and, and spending patterns, uh, incentives as well. Uh, but there's a lot of, of good action that can and needs to be done there to help make 2030, 2040, 2050 timelines actually achievable. So uh, check, apologies for the scrolling slides before I was trying to check out what we've got in the chat. I'm going to work this into the question for Karen and Nidhi. 
Um, and I just wanted to note for those of you watching on our YouTube overflow room, you can email my colleague Andy at a Barnes, B A R N E S, at CEBN.org, and he'll try to put your questions into the chat. Um, but we heard just now, so this over to Karen and maybe we heard from John and Charles about some of the priorities we might expect if we continue to have a divided Congress. And we heard about innovation, regulatory reform, resilience, um, you know, as, as well as kind of shifting some of the, the tools to the private sector and to states. Um, now, let's envision a scenario where Democrats do take control of the Senate. What additional policies do you anticipate making it through Congress? And uh, specifically, I want to reference one of our participants um, in a chat asked about carbon pricing. Is that even on the agenda? What types of, uh, you know, of the more ambitious aspects of the Biden proposal do you think would have a chance of making it through? Well, I'll start and then pass it off to Nitty. But I, I think that if there were going to be a discussion around carbon pricing, it would continue to be happening at FERC and not in Congress. So, um, so I think there'll be continued conversations around that. The, you know, they just held a technical conference, um, and and that may be one reason that the chair, the Republican chair of FERC, was demoted to a regular commissioner because uh, because he was. Um, uh, encouraging those conversations with the states on, and with others on carbon pricing. But in Congress, I think that, that uh, I think that we have to be very careful in thinking that, you know, if the Democrats took the two seats in Georgia, that all of a sudden that there would be 60 votes for everything. And in the Congress, most things have to happen with 60 votes. I think it's a, 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 a very aggressive climate agenda is not likely to get 60 votes. But there are certainly gonna be places and pieces there. I think a lot of people have been talking about using the reconciliation pro process to get things done. And the reconciliation process is a budget process that only requires um, 50 votes or 51 votes. So, so um, the reconciliation process is very tough. It's, it's very much revenue driven and, um, and it, it it is not going to be an easy way to move, you know, massive climate policy. I would say it's not even going to be an easy way to move a recovery act style level of, of um, stimulus investments um, because of the revenue requirements around what a reconciliation package looks like. So, and it, but it'll take longer too because you've got to have a budget resolution and then the and then the committees have to do um, their own reconciliation. So it's not going to be like a supplemental appropriation that the Recovery Act was, which got, I think, 61, 62 votes in 2009. So I, I think that um, people have to scale their um, expectations to a 50, you know, let's say we win the Georgia race to a, um, a, a caucus that has Senator Manchin, that has, um, you know, some of these Georgia senators, that has uh, a number of other senators that are going to have a different situations in their state that they have to respond to. So, um, I, I, again, this is where I'm glad that Joe Biden is going to be president, because if anybody can navigate those discussions, um, it, it will be Biden. Andy, do we still have you on, or do we lose you there for a minute? I'm still here. Can you... Oh, great. Yeah. Can you me? Okay, great. Yeah. I just had you on mute. Um, yeah, so I think, you know, look, I think, um, you know, if we have a Republican majority Senate, there's obviously going to be much less room for aggressive climate policy. I think the reality is, though, that, you know, market mechanisms, um, carbon pricing is just one example of those. I think that conversation is going to be live irrespective of who has control of the Senate. Um, you know, to Karen's point about, I actually was going to mention the same thing on in terms of FERC and carbon pricing. You know, I think that's one example where you have an agency that has quite a bit of um, runway to start thinking about additional market mechanisms to support rapid and, um, you know, mass decarbonization in addition to advancing innovative technologies. I mean, there's a lot that FERC could be doing with the regional transmission operators and the independent system operators, you know, in terms of trying to price certain resources within regional markets that can support um, a very aggressive climate strategy while supporting new industries and while supporting 
um, innovation and, and frankly, the business community through that process. So, you know, I, I would also say that I think um, you know, Karen, Karen raised a lot of what I would, in terms of what would happen in Congress, but I think irrespective of what we see in the Senate, um, you know, I think there's a tremendous amount of runway and opportunity for the federal agencies to take action that can occur, you know, from the direction of the White House through executive orders and or guidance, but, you know, agencies themselves can do a lot through rulemakings um, and, we saw that actually at the end of the Obama administration with reforms to the federal coal program and the administration saying, you know, the Obama administration saying, we're going to look at a, a completely outdated program um, for for federal coal leasing on public lands. That program has not been looked at in the last 50 years. We are going to issue a moratorium on any new federal coal lease on public lands. And we're going to actually do a programmatic assessment of that program, which hadn't occurred again in 50 years. So, you know, I think that's just one of the many examples we saw um, the Obama administration's methane venting and flaring rules, um, which Charles referenced earlier. You know, I would I would agree that there is a need for consistency and regulation um, for the business community. I think, you know, you can't have innovation thrive um, if you don't have some clear runway on what your regulatory future is going to look like. You know, I think, again, that's a bipartisan um, uh, issue. I don't think that, that that really plays necessarily into politics. Um, and then I would also just add that, you know, I think Charles also raised, um, you know, he talked a little bit about offshore wind, for example, as one of these emerging technologies uh, where it still takes quite a bit of time to permit projects. And you know, I would go back to something the Obama administration did that was really helpful, and that was from an agency standpoint. You know, BOEM issued a programmatic environmental impact statement that basically then stood up these leasing blocks, and they worked very closely with the states to find areas where there was broad stakeholder support from the environmental and the business community, um, where, where stakeholders could come together and say, hey, this is, this is an area we can agree upon that should be open to leasing and the development of um, new offshore wind projects. And I think that those kind of cooperative relationships between the feds and the states and that kind of executive um, action that we can see from the agencies is going to be extremely important and extremely critical um, irrespective of what we see in the Senate. Great. And I think both of you just touched on uh, several of the questions that have been raised. Uh, you know, um, we had some questions regarding prospects on the 60 vote threshold and I think Karen really addressed that well and maybe you start to get into another topic we're going to get into in just a moment which is on um, executive branch actions. I do want to turn to one question uh, we received in the chat box um, relating to if, if any of you wanted to expand further on policies aside from LIHEAP that might be helpful to uh, lower income residents that are struggling to pay their energy bills to actually help upgrade their energy infrastructure or to help utilities provide support to their customers. Do you have thoughts on additional programs aside from LIHEAP that would be helpful in that regard? I would say from the perspective of, of our utility in Oregon, LIHEAP is actually one of the most critical programs that we rely, rely upon. Um, in Oregon. Um, so, you know, I think additional funding for energy efficiency is also very much important. You know, I think as we think about how we're going to electrify in the future, um, there's there is a real question about the haves and haves not um, regarding that effort. You know, I, I dealt with this in California to some degree when I was at the state state's PAC commission. Um, you know, the, the conversation about electrification, both from a transportation perspective and from a building perspective, um, you know, there's still a real hurdle to uh, what the infrastructure costs are associated with, for example, installing a heat pump in your home or installing EV charging, even if there are rebates and incentives and other sort of subsidies that can support consumer adoption. Um, you know, when you're somebody who is trying to figure out how you're going to pay your electric bill for the month, those kind of, um, you know, opportunities just look like luxuries. So I, I'll actually go back to LIHEAP and say that that's been a real critical program for us in Oregon. And, um, you know, I say that from the perspective of the fact that Oregon is um, more of a rural and poor state. 
comparatively speaking. So um, another, so we began that conversation of, um, and Nidhi actually raised this, the executive branch actions and opportunities. And um, so, you know, one of the things, and, and this is actually kind of teeing off something that one of our participants raised in the chat, I, I think there's a lot of um, strategy that the Biden administration is going to have to keep in mind in deciding what to proactively advance as a Biden administration agenda and what to allow Congress to advance. And, you know, I think Charles and, and John raised some some of that discussion about allowing uh, some space for Republican members of Congress to introduce and champion proposals. Like, you know, there are some things that could have uh, common interest on both sides of the aisle. And so, um, Maybe I'll start then going, going back to you, John and Charles. What are some things that you hope the Biden administration will not try to champion and will kind of allow for space for conservatives to take ownership of? Well, I, I don't know if, um, I don't know that any politician will ever cede territory on an issue completely, but um, and, and that's certainly not not what I would ask for. But I, I think that where we want to see more collaboration and cooperation and probably uptake of conservative um, ideas are are what's happening in the voluntary uh, voluntary carbon reduction space. Uh, the Growing Climate Solutions Act is a, a bipartisan bill that was introduced in the Senate, championed by Senator Braun, introduced in the House. Uh, bipartisan as well, and it, and it focuses on providing um, technical assistance to farmers to re sequester and reduce carbon dioxide emissions on their land. Third parties can uh, can pay for those credits. Uncle Sam's role is relatively small. Will it solve the climate problem completely? No, but it is a great mechanism for dialing farmers in to be part of climate solutions uh, and retaining a, a control over over their lands and being able to make some of the investments that they might not otherwise. Uh, be able to afford. So to see, um, uh, you know, to see uh, a President Biden's administration champion uh, ideas like that would help help those kinds of ideas get over the finish line. More uh, voluntary proposals to help uh, provide information and transparency to consumers on what's the carbon content of of uh, some of their goods or or some of the major companies that are uh, making these proclamations to say that they're on the path to net zero or have achieved net zero uh, in their uh, renewable energy procurement, um, to be able to provide more visibility into that without regulation, but to do it on a voluntary basis um, is going to be a good thing. And, and I think that one major area where um, I hope that there's opportunity for continued discussion and, and I think uptake by the Biden administration is, is that that focuses on trade. Um, President Trump will be remembered for a lot of things, but I think one of the positive uh, things that we do need to look at is the, the realignment and clear focus on China um, as a part of uh, the, our problem from a, from a trade standpoint. But if you look at carbon emissions globally and you look at U.S. competitiveness, um, at this point, we import a lot of um, concrete, iron, steel uh, from China that has a higher embedded carbon content in it. Um, and so, uh, you know, the Chinese firms aren't held to the same environmental standards. They're not held to the same labor standards. Um, and I think that this look at what is the appropriate intersection of trade and climate is something that we're going to need to focus on uh, in the near future. The European Union is looking at a border carbon adjustment uh, that they would set to establish within uh, over the course of the next few years. They're in the early stages of that, but that's something we need to negotiate on. We need to have our, our plan together, and I'd hope to see uh, leadership from American leaders uh, in the White House, but in the House and Senate that have a role on appropriate committees um, to take a look at that. And, and we're not talking about trade and, you know, looking at climate impact for every good and service that's out there, but for iron, for steel, for concrete, for the real heavy products that do have um uh, a lot of embedded emissions in them that get put into federal buildings or get put into other buildings. Uh, you know, those emissions stick around for a long time. Uh, so if there's a way to focus on that more, I think we'll be well served. 
Yeah, I would, I would just echo Charles and uh, agree with everything he said. I would, I would emphasize the international focus. Like one of the conservative critiques of the Green New Deal is that it was really focused on the U.S. And even if it was implemented, you'd have to do NEPA reform, but also it would also have almost no impact on global temperatures. And we have to have a very robust, strong international focus, and there's no easy answer there. Uh, but that has to be front and center in the conversation. Uh, and the three other quick areas, I think if the Biden administration could have an, an authentic dialogue on setting priorities within the federal budget, that would go a very long way to getting bipartisan support for any increased investments in research and development and basic innovation. Not, not so much new subsidies. It's going to be hard to get conservatives on board with, quote, picking winners and losers. But if you can have an all of the above technology neutral uh, focus, that's focused on basic R&D that reprograms funds, that would go a long way. Uh, I think nuclear energy, we haven't talked a lot about. Uh, that's that's an area of, of potential agreements. Uh, that's, frankly, I think it's more of a communication public relations problem. So I think a lot of that's nuclear energy and how do you... How do you come up with a way of selling that technology uh, and overcoming the Chernobyl effect, which we all understand uh, very well? Um, and I think I think reforming the national flood insurance program, that's an issue that can affect a lot of homeowners, uh, can have ripple effects in the economy. It's it's outdated, it's underfunded, it's it's massively in debt. The data does not reflect current risk. The First Street Foundation has done great work on that, of describing the extent to which our, our flood maps are, are not... Uh, up up to date. I think those are those are just a, a few areas, but uh, I'm sure there are others. Yeah, all these are really helpful insights, and um, I know a lot of the things that both of you mentioned have bipartisan support. So then, I guess turning quickly to Karen and Nidhi, um what are some of the policies that you can envision the Biden administration passing through executive action, and in particular, uh, you know, both Charles and John raised the international landscape, and I know Biden has committed to rejoining the Paris Agreement on day one. So what are some of the prospects in particular that you see on global climate and clean energy cooperation? Sure. Um, I'll jump in here real quick, Karen, and and, um, and turn it over to you. Um, you know, I think I'll, I'll talk a little bit from the domestic perspective first. I mean, I think um, you know, we've seen the, the number of rollbacks that have occurred under this current administration, under the Trump administration. Um, you know, Trump has repealed or weakened over 125 environmental regulations, from everything dealing with the um, Endangered Species Act to environmental risk assessments. Um, for infrastructure, he's uh, promoted and pushed for opening up ANWR, um, which has been a very sacred place for a long time for a lot of people and um, for, you know, for uh, increased development of oil and gas on public lands. Um, you know, I would say one of the first things you'll probably see is going to be a swing in the other direction. You're going to see a very um, strong desire to roll back the rollbacks and to try to figure out, um, you know, how we can, again, focus on uh, deep decarbonization um, in an environmentally sustainable way that promotes conservation of species and lands. Um, you know, I think there's no silver bullet to um, meeting deep decarbonization goals, and I think it's going to really take um, a balanced mix of strategies to, to get to that target. You know, the electricity sector is a very uh, is very much a least common denominator when it comes to that discussion. Um, you know, we have to start thinking more about how we can keep electricity um, as clean as possible and, uh, you know, still keep the resource um, resource costs low so consumers have affordable service and uh, can access clean energy through that process, you know, through, through that essential service. Um, and we have to give more thought to how electricity, electricity costs can, um, can also... Uh, continue to support a, you know, can be low and continue to support a rapidly decarbonized future. Um, again, I think the transportation sector is going to be very critical in addressing this challenge. Um, and, you know, I would say that, um, you know, on the, on the uh, uh, international side, you know, joining Paris is um, a clear step and commitment that the administration has agreed to take. I think, you know, 
I think there's a big question around whether the the goals that are in that agreement are even strong enough anymore based on um, how much of an existential crisis we're seeing climate um, look like these days. You know, I think I'd actually like to just come back to something John said real quick, too. I mean, he mentioned the flood insurance program, which is um, which I, I would probably just say I don't think it's probably top of mind for, you know, most people in the country. I'm going to throw out another crazy idea um you know we may be <clears throat> at the place where we have to start thinking about um a federal program around wildfire insurance and i raise this having lived in the west for the last three years and lived um you know i was in the bay area for two years and now in portland oregon and i've now lived in um, a city in the world with the worst air quality for the last three years in a row and i've moved so you know, all of these impacts, um, these climate impacts are, are manifesting themselves in different ways on the East Coast. It's flooding and it's hurricanes and in the West it's wildfires and, um, you know, drought, uh, which is causing all sorts of other problems. And, you know, what we're seeing in the West, I'll just tell you, is um, a big change in the insurance industry. You know, when I was at the CPUC in California, we... Um, basically created the the fire maps for the state um, based on sort of uh, tier one, two, and three level threats for wildfires. And that those fire maps were from a regular, you know, they're a regulatory document. They were used against consumers in the state and they can't, you know, get um, insurance on their homes or their premiums are out of the roof and they have to go to a secondary market. And if, you know, let alone if you're someone who's um, dealt with a very tragic event of losing everything you have and have to rebuild, um, what does that look like for you? And can you even access insurance in where you'd like in the areas you'd like to rebuild and, and live in? These are people's homes and communities, right? And um, you know, we could be seeing um, if we continue to see a trend with wildfires in the West that we are right now, we could be at a point where we are seeing a mass exodus of um, folks from the insurance industry. And what is that going to mean for um, you know uh, residential? Um, uh, the, the residential public in terms of also and also sort of the larger commercial industry. Um, so I think, you know, I'm going to throw that crazy out, idea out there that I've, I've been thinking for many years now that we may be in a place like we were with the flood insurance program where we have to start thinking about, um, you know, wildfire insurance and what that looks like in the West. I haven't heard anybody really mention anything about um, cybersecurity. And so I know we're two minutes in to drop a bomb like cybersecurity into these discussions. But I do think that um, the Biden administration is going to have to really get a handle around the um, the way that it um, the federal government deals with the cyber risks that are only increasing, both because the entire economy is 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 growing increasingly digital, but because um you know, the electricity sector and, and the under climate solutions, we're going to need a more connected, more coordinated um, energy system. So cyber uh, and the bulk power system executive order, I think, will will likely have to be revisited. But that's a, that's you can have a whole nother topic on that. No, I'm glad you raised that. That's a, a great point. And we have a ton of fantastic questions in the chat. Unfortunately, we're not going to have time to get to them all. So I'm going to try a creative way to rapid fire answer these questions, which is, Thumbs up or thumbs down from our panelists, do you think, whether through congressional or administrative action, we are likely to see action on tax incentives? We got it. Okay, I like this. Four thumbs up. Um, what do you think about rolling back the, um, the Department of Labor requirements on uh, kind of the hindering ability for 401k plans to invest in ESG? Are we likely to see a, a rollback of that? Maybe? Iffy? Iffy? Okay. The, okay, maybe. <laughs> so that's uncertain. Um, are we likely to see prevailing wages and other labor standards in clean energy projects? I think mostly no. Oh, split yes, Congress on this one. You might not like it, but but you're likely to see it. <laughs> we're likely to see it, whether That's we like it or not. I think, I think we're likely to see it. And are we likely yes. to see yeah. any, um, that, That's helpful. And are we likely to see any types of um, return of social cost of carbon or other sort of emissions considerations in federal infrastructure spending? I think there's a strong potential for that. Yeah. Yeah. 
Maybe. 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 We'll see. We'll, we'll see. Um, really appreciate all of your insights. This has been a very insightful conversation, and I, I think just the start of many that we will be having. Uh, these are pr predictions about what is to come, but certainly we will know more as we begin to see committee leaders and um, you know some of these these seats that are in place take hold. Before we adjourn, I just want to uh, point out two ways that all of our participants can get involved. And one of our goals is to really make sure that the folks listening in on this conversation know how to make your voices heard. So first, I want to flag a project called Clean Economy Employment Now, which is an initiative of a number of um, kind of very experienced investors and executives in the clean energy industry to try to democratize the um, sourcing of ideas for policy proposals. There's a very simple, easy to navigate two page form where you can put forward any idea, large or small, crazy or, or conservative and simple um, for what you would like to see accomplished on climate and energy legislation or, or policies in the next administration and Congress. And that will be compiled into a publicly available database as well as shared with a variety of industry advisors who can kind of put this forward in recommendations to the policymakers. And I would also say for those of you with political ambition, Clean Energy for Biden, which is represented today by NIDI, um, has sort of trans been transitioning away from the supporting of the Biden campaign to looking forward to soliciting ideas for a range of energy and climate related political appointments to the federal agencies. And they're, um, you know, they've made the transition team aware of that effort. They're particularly interested in candidates with direct business expertise in clean energy and clean tech, along with women and people of color or other underrepresented groups. So if you feel like you have the political chops and are interested in those positions, please click on that link to express your interest in a variety of agencies. And um, I just want to say thank you so much to our fabulous panelists for taking the time today and for all of your views. Thank you to all of you for joining us. And thanks again to Crest Forum for partnering with us on this event.